So, um, this is Whispering Myth, and I'm coming to you in a fashion that I have not before. <laughs> I bought a new computer, and my computer has not um, got the same program that I used to do with my videos. So, I am using the camera itself uh, in conjunction with a headphone that I have. And um, I figure I'll do this. I just don't bother looking at the screen because this head, though I like it, is, um, I don't know, it's not exactly going to match up with the way I speak or the way I move my eyelids. Um, to be honest with you. Um, but, uh, at any rate, so, um, it has been a while. Uh, I apologize for that, but, you know, the show will go on. Um, so, I, uh, have been wanting to do a reading from a book that was actually, uh, my locating it was inspired by another ASMR artist named Amandine Lelou, ASMR. Now, um, I had seen her uploading stuff up until maybe like a couple weeks ago, but when I go online to find her, now I'm not finding her. So, I don't know if she deleted her account, or if something happened with her account, and as a result, it's just not currently active where it can be found. But, um, hopefully she's still, you know, participating in the ASMR community and will, um, be able to hear me thanking her for her basically kind of setting me out a direction that helped me find this book that I'm about to begin reading from. Um, if, um, I do notice that she gets back on, I will try to put her link in the text information of this video. But, um, the name of the book is The White Stag, and, um, just the background, she had been doing a video about wolves, um, and her personal feelings towards wolves as a creature. So I was trying to think of a creature that I personally felt a connection with, and the idea of the white stag came to my mind. And so I just kind of started looking up stuff about white stags. And what was really cool is um, I'm a quarter Hungarian. My father's father was an immigrant from there. Um, and uh, I, I remembered after finding this that this was the case, but I had forgotten that the white stag actually plays an important part in uh, Hungarian mythology. So, I, uh, when I found out about this book that had to do with white stags, it's called The White Stag, it's by Kate Sarity, um, and that it was about Hungarian mythology, that was just exciting, you know, because it gave me something to do for here, but it also gave me, you know, something that ties me into mythology to some, exi to some extent, if that makes any sense. So, um... Anyway, it's just a very personal reading. Uh, I will admit to you, I have held off on reading this at all um, until I was able to read it to all of you. So, this will be my first experience reading the myths of my people. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, as they appear in this book at any rate. So, um, without further ado, I will go ahead and begin reading from The White Stag. We'll start at the opening. Um, those who want to hear the voice of pagan gods and wind and thunder, who want to see fairies dance in the moonlight, who can believe that faith can move mountains, can follow the thread on the pages of this book. It is a fragile thread. It cannot bear the weight of facts and dates. Here is the epic story of the migration of the Huns and Magyars from Asia to Europe 
written in beautiful rhythmic prose with pictures that reflect the breathtaking pageantry of history. This is the foreword. Not so long ago, I was leafing through a very modern book on Hungarian history. It was a typical 20th century book. Its pages and unending chain of facts, 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 as irrefutable, logical, and as hard as the learned pens of learned historians could make them. Turning the pages, I felt as if I were walking in a typical 20th century city, city laid out in measured blocks, glaring with the merciless white light of knowledge. Its streets smooth, hard, concrete facts. One could not stumble on streets like that, nor could one ever get lost. Every corner is so plainly marked with dates. My eyes fell on a paragraph. The early history of the Hungarian Magyar race is a matter of learned dispute. Their own traditions declare them to be descendants of the horde which sent forth the Huns from Asia in the 4th century. Our present knowledge of the history and distribution of the Huns tends to disprove this theory. Well, I closed the book and I closed my eyes. And then I saw an old garden, the great neglected park of old Hun Magyar legends, with moss creeping over the shadowy paths, paths which twisted and turned, which led into hidden nooks where fantastic flowers grew around crumbling monuments of pagan gods. And I saw a little girl and her father tiptoeing along those winding paths, trailing the mat white stag gazing breathlessly into the circle of birch trees where moon maidens danced on a carpet of flowers, standing awed and still before the tomb of Nimrod, mighty hunter before the Lord, and bowing their heads to the great crumbling stone altar of Hader, powerful god of Huns and Magyars. Often a path ended abruptly where a gigantic tree had crashed to the ground, its torn branches entwined in the creeping vines of centuries, but always the white stag appeared to show them a new path. It was beautiful, that park of legends, and the little girl who was I had never forgotten it. And now, thirty years later, I went back again to walk those winding paths, to listen to the scream of the eagles, to pay homage to a race of brave men, men whose faith in their own destiny had led them to a land they still call their own. I went back, but this time I walked alone, and I took a ball of golden thread with me, and unwound it as I trailed the white stag of legends from the great tomb of Nimrom to the green plains between two blue rivers, the Hungarian plains. Those who want to hear the voice of pagan gods and wind and thunder, who want to see fairies dance in the moonlight, who can believe that faith can move mountains, can follow the thread on the pages of this book. It is a fragile thread. It cannot bear the weight of facts and dates. Part 1. Nimrod the Mighty Hunter <coughs> Old Nimrod, mighty hunter before the Lord, leaned wearily against the stones of the sacrificial altar. There was sadness in his face, dejection in the stoop of his broad shoulders. The altar stones were cold to his touch. Many a sun had set since the tribe could play tribute, excuse me, pay tribute to Hader, their powerful god. Sheep and cattle had died of a strange ailment. Game had deserted forest and field. There was nothing to offer on the altar. Once in a while he lifted his bowed head and looked around, his eyes searching the paths amongst the trees, his ears turned to catch the slightest noise. Nothing stirred. Silence hung heavy in the air. Then he would bow his head again and remain motionless, lost in thought for a long time. The formidable snow-capped mountains around the altar place looked down on him in supreme indifference. They knew him as he knew them. He had hunted their thickly wooded slopes almost all his life. He knew that beyond these mountains were others, peak upon peak, steep, cold, almost impassable, an army of hostile mountains. Now he remembered the years of struggle and suffering while he had crossed them, leading his people, always following the sun from east to west. He remembered the years before that, the happy years when he was young and strong and heedless, son of Cush, the great leader, the time when all people were brothers and spoke the same language. 
the years when in their vain pride people wanted to reach heaven and build the Tower of Babel, the dreadful day of terror, when for their foolhardy daring they were punished. And brother ceased to understand brother, when the terrific storm came and scattered them all over the earth, like so many dry leaves scattered by the wind. After the storm, he and a handful of his people found themselves in a strange land, cold, rocky, barren. For a long, long time they suffered from cold and hunger. And then came the day when he again heard the voice of God, thunder, and was given the power to understand it. He knew from then on what he had to do. Somewhere there was a land, rich in game and green pastures, between two great rivers, plentiful in fish, surrounded by mountains, warmed by the sun, sheltered from the cold. And this place would be the home of his people, if he could lead them wisely from east to west, always following the sun to the promised land. Many a time he thought that they had found this land, but each time Hader spoke again, and he led his people farther toward the west. Now he was old, and soon the time would come when younger leaders would be needed. The tribe had grown until their numbers were as many as there were stars in the sky. They were strong and fearless, not a weakling among them. They would follow only the strongest, most fearless of leaders, one who could bend their recklessness to his will and bow his head to no one, only Hader, the powerful god. There were two such men in the tribe, two brothers, sons of old Nimrod, Hunor and Magyar. They could ride faster, shoot straighter, fight harder than any other man. They could read the signs of sun, moon, fire, and water. They would lead the tribe toward the promised land, for they too understood the voice of Hador when it spoke in the wind and in thunder. Old Nimrod lifted his head again to scan the darkening forest around him. He was waiting for his sons this evening, as he had waited for them every day at sunset since they rode away seven moons ago to follow a stag, a miraculous white stag. It had appeared one day at sunset on the edge of the forest near the altar place. No one else had seen it, only Nimrod and his sons. No one else had seen it, outlined against the western sky with the red setting sun shining through its majestic antlers almost as if it were supporting the sun. Hanor and Magyar had ridden off to capture it, leaving old Nimrod behind, for he was too old for a long hunt. Since then, he had been waiting every day at sunset for their return. Now, as the red sun touched the rim of the mountains, Nimrod turned to the altar, and lifting his arm, sighed in prayer. O oh, powerful Hanor, have pity on me and my people. They are suffering with hunger. I am suffering with shame, for I have nothing to offer thee. Give me a sign to show me what I can do to appease thy anger. The silence was broken by a soft, neighing sound. Something cool and moist touched his arm. Tautus, his horse, faithful friend and companion of many great hunts, had come up to him silently and stood close now, his whole body trembling. Old Nimrod looked at the beautiful animal for a long time. Slowly, two large tears rolled down his cheeks, so I must make an offering. The greatest sacrifice is wanted by thee, Hader, he sighed. With tender hands, he patted the trembling animal's neck, then turned away quickly and lighted the sacrificial fire on the altar. Smoke billowed and hung sluggishly in the still air. When the red flames kicked, excuse me, when the red flames licked through small kindling and caught the heavy logs, he led the horse up on the altar steps. For one long moment, man and beast looked at each other. Then, with a great broken sob, old Nimrod grasped his heavy war club and, gathering all his strength, brought it down on the animal's forehead. The horse fell without a sound. Old Nimrod crumpled on his knees. He bent lower and lower until his head touched the ground. For a long time, only the sharp crackling of burning wood broke the silence. Flames rose higher and higher. The crackling was submerged in the increasing roar of the fire. The sound grew, and other sounds mingled with it. Howls of wind which sprang from nowhere, rushing of water, 
thundering hoofbeats, screams of horses, cries of men and women. Old Nimrod staggered to his feet and looked around with dazed eyes. From the camping ground, his people running toward him, stumbling, falling, pushed by a terrific gale. Tents were torn from their moorings and carried away. Horses had broken loose. They ran around wild-eyed and screaming. Sparks and flames of the fire had been blown into the grass around the altar and were burning a broad path toward the mountains, a clear-cut path, a highway of leaping, roaring fire toward the west. Now thunder, frightening, long-drawn-out, deafening thunder added its voice to the tumult. The ground shook as it reached its climax with a terrific crash. People fell on the ground and lay trembling, too frightened to cry out. Only old Nimrod remained standing, a tall, majestic figure, with his arms stretched straight up to the angry sky. Speak, O powerful hater, speak to thy servant, he cried. Another thunder shook the ground in a third. After that came silence so sudden and so deep that it was more terrifying than the storm before. The wind ceased as suddenly as it had come, and the smoke rose once more straight into the air. Only the path of fire crept slowly westward, burning high and bright. Then a new sound, a scream, piercing and high, rent the silence. It was the scream of an eagle, so shrill, so imperious, that everyone looked up in wonder. They saw a great eagle, holy bird of Ader, circling slowly over the column of smoke. It cried again, and hovered for a moment, suspended motionlessly, motionlessly on its giant wings. Then it plunged headlong into the fire. A gasp of horror rose from the people, but old Nimrod said, Have no fear, my people. Hader is speaking. Behold, where one eagle had been before, two more were circling. They flew side by side, their great wings touching, circled three times and flew off, one to the west, one to the north. Another eagle appeared as if it had taken shape from the smoke, circled around seven times and disappeared to give place to still another. A giant bird greeted the fall. Its tremendous wings caught the glow from the fire. It seemed red as blood. Its voice rose into a piercing, victorious cry as it soared higher and higher and finally flew in a straight line toward the west. Old Nimrod followed its flight with his eyes until it was no bigger than a speck of dust in the sky. Then he turned to his people and said, Hader has spoken. Listen to me, brothers. The first eagle told us that I, your leader for so many years, shall not be with you for long. I shall soon leave to go to the land of my fathers. My place will be taken by two leaders, Hunor and Magyar. They will lead you nearer the promised land, but they shall not see it. After they are gone, there shall be another leader, and it will be his son, greatest of all, with a mighty voice and wings, red as blood, who will lead you into the promised land. His power will be so great that the earth will tremble the stars fall down at his approach. His warriors will be more than the grains of sand or blades of grass on the plains. Under the hoofs of their horses, the ground will groan, and the air will echo the clanking of their countless swords. He will be called the Scourge of Hador, for nothing can resist his ruthless progress into the land of his destiny. The Scourge of Hador, greatest of all warriors, Attila. Hador has spoken. We will obey. It has spoken, we will obey, repeated the listeners in a low murmur. Then the clear voice of a child rang out. But where are Hunor and Magyar? They went away seven moons ago. They are coming back soon, answered Nimrod. They are coming now, cried the child, pointing to the west. Two riders appeared on the crest of the hill and rode swiftly nearer, skirting the path of fire. They rode side by side, their spurred boots touching. Their saddles were laden with game, their faces proud and happy. <coughs> Twin eagles of Hader, whispered a woman. The crowd stirred in excitement. People repeated the woman's, the women's words, first in puzzled whispers, then in a great joyous shout, Hunor Magyar, twin eagles of Hader, welcome. 
schooner of Magyar leapt from their saddles and ran to old Nimrod. He embraced them silently. After a moment, Hinor lifted his head and looked intently into his father's face. Father, you are pale and trembling. What has happened? He made a sweeping gesture with his hand. The people here, the path of fire, it met us far, far beyond the hills. Tell us the meaning of it. Old Nimrod smiled. I will tell you, my son, but I see that you have had a good hunt. You have brought game. Our people are hungry. Let us have a feast. At his signal, men sprang forward and unloaded the game from the saddles. Soon huge fires were burning, and the smell of roasting meat, of deer, wild boar, and rabbits filled the air. The worst pangs of hunger appeased. People began to sing and laugh. By the time the full round moon sailed into view, he looked down on a happy, boisterous scene. Hunger and terror were forgotten once more. Young men of the tribe were dancing around the fire, the wild dance of lucky hunters. Women sang, and children scampered around like bouncing rabbits. Only old Nimrod was quiet and thoughtful. He had not touched food or drink, but listened intently to the talk of Humanor and Magyar, and answered their eager questions. And finally, the merrymaking passed its peak. He walked slowly up the altar steps. He held up his hand, commanding silence. Then he began to speak. My people, you have seen the sunset on a day so pretentious that it will be remembered long after we, who have been part of it, are dust and ashes. Before the pale white sister of the sun disappears behind the mountains, you will swear obedience to your new leaders, Yonor and Magyar. It is seldom that Hedor the Powerful speaks as clearly as he has spoken tonight, so clearly that even a child can understand his words. All of you have seen and heard, and all of you will obey. There is one thing you must know. You know, Magyar will tell you the story of the travels of seven moons. It is the final proof that they were chosen to be your leaders. His two sons stepped up and stood by his side. They were very tall and powerful. But old Nimrod towered over them as a majestic old oak towers over young saplings. At the sight of the three gigantic figures, illuminated by the pale white light of the moon, a murmur of awe rose from the crowd. Then humor began his story. Seven moons ago, a miraculous white stag appeared on the crest of the hill. He was white as the driven snow, and bigger than any stag ever seen by man. He waited until we were so close to him that we thought we could touch him with our hands. Then he spun around and leapt away as lightly as sunlight leaps over running water. His legs were slim as the branches of white birch, and he ran swifter than the wind. All night he ran through forests and plains, across rivers and over mountains, and we rode after him as we had never ridden before. The hoofs of our horses never touched the ground. We soared over valleys and left mountains far below us. When morning came to the white, the white stag stopped on the edge of a misty blue lake. As he stopped, our horses fell back exhausted. They stumbled and snorted and would not move again. The white stag pawed the ground where he stood and shook his antlers. Then he disappeared in the floating mist over the water. All that day we searched for him. We did not see him again. We only found the place where he had pulled the ground. There were seven deep rifts in the ground, cut deep and wide, as no living beast could cut them. And we saw that the blue lake was full of fish, the green meadows alive with rabbits, the forest around it teeming with deer and other big game. There were trees heavy with fruit, and the air was sweet with the breath of beautiful flowers. We saw that in that land there would be room and food for all of us. We rested there for a short time, then started back. The white stag had led us there, and one night it took us seven moons to come back again. While Hunor told his story, the listeners had left their fires and crowded closer and closer, till they were standing in a tight ring around the altar. Now old Nimrod mounted to the very highest steps, so close to the still smoking, glowing embers that he seemed enveloped in a red mist. His face was pale and haggard, and there was a far-seeing, piercing look in his eyes. In one hand he held his war club, and the other his bow and arrow. These he held out to his sons, who, kneeling before him, took them from his hands. Then he spoke. 
my work is done. Tomorrow you will go forth to lead your people toward the promised land. Twin eagles of Hader, Hunor and Magyar, go and fulfill the will of God. His eyes closed as he uttered these last words. Then, with a crash like that of a fallen tree, he fell on the highest step of the altar. The crowd gasped in horror. Women wailed and children started to cry. But sounds of horror and mourning were drowned by a tremendous shout from the young warriors and hunters. Long live you, nor a Magyar, twin equals of Hadar. The two brothers remained kneeling by their dead father's side for long minutes. Then they arose. Magyar turned to the tribe. Light the torches of the dead, he commended. One by one, the warriors stepped to the dying embers and lighted pitch-coated torches. Soon, there were hundreds of them burning around the altar. The whole valley seemed to flame once more, and black smoke coiled upward, blotting out the sky. Hunor and Magyar, each with a burning torch, stood by the body of Nimrod. Hunor then lifted his voice. Light up the world, my torch. Shine brighter, O moon, stars, and sun. Hold awake over Nimrod, mighty hunter, before the Lord. Shed bitter tears, O cloud, soil, trees, and grass. Shed bitter tears for Nimrod, mighty hunter, before the Lord. Bow your heads, all you living, bow your heads to Nimrod, mighty hunter, before the Lord. Then cheer and dance and rejoice, all you living. Shine brighter, moon, stars, and sun. Cry tears of joy, cloud, soil, trees, and grass. For now he is soaring over the happy meadows. For he is not taking shame but glory to lay before Hador, the powerful god. Everyone repeated, he is taking not shame but glory to lay before Hador, the powerful god. Now, Hunor and Magyar fastened their torches to the altar stones. All others were extinguished. Magyar stepped forward and cried, Move the mountains, men. Move the rocks and the soil with your bare hands to build a mighty tomb for the mighty hunter. In the eerie light of white moon and flickering torches, the immense task began. Men tore boulders from the mountainside and rolled them to the altar. Women and children carried clay from the river in their hands. Rocks were fitted together with the clay until they formed a gigantic mound over the altar, a mound shaped like an inverted cup, tapering toward the top and hollow inside. Finally, there was only a small opening on the top through which the glow and smoke of the torches poured. <coughs> only then did Tinor speak again. Go and rest, brothers, until the sun comes up. With the sun, we shall go forth toward the west. The two brothers were left alone. They stayed by their father's grave for the rest of the night, watching the moon go down behind the hills, watching the first faint glow of a new day in the easterly sky. With the growing light came sounds of the awakening camp. Magyar roused himself out of his deep thoughts and touched his brother's shoulder. The tribe is ready. We must go now. The women came first, leaving the children. Everyone had a flower in her hand. Silently, they passed by the grave and dropped their flowers at its base. The men came next, leading their horses. Everyone stopped to place a gift on the grave. An arrow, a wooden cup, a leather pouch, a favorite club. All passed, and slowly the caravan began to move westward, following the now blackened path of the fire. Eunor then shouldered a big square rock and walked slowly and laboriously to the top of the mound. Magar followed. They rolled the rock over the opening, sealing it. Then they lifted their hunting bugles to their lips. A proud, triumphant tune rent the still air and echoed from the mountains a thousandfold until its voice seemed to beat against the very sky. A bugle call of victory and last tribute to Nimrod, mighty hunter before the Lord. Cool. I think that's where we'll stop for this time around. Um, because we've been, luckily, have not had anybody interrupt us. <laughs> um, but I hope you enjoyed, and hopefully I won't have any problems getting this up. And hopefully uh, my next video in this series will come more quickly. But uh, y'all take care, and yeah. <laughs>